Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you very much, Trevor, for, for leading us. And also, uh, I think for all of us, uh, being able to stand back and hear how God's led us this morning through his prayers uh, and through your response. Uh, it does feel like God has, has led us to, to where we're meant to be and where I think we're going to be going for the next few weeks uh, together. So I'm excited about that. Um, it was one of those weeks where things came together a bit too easily, which always makes me nervous um, in, in what I want to say. But um, we're going to start a new series uh, for the next five weeks, and then we've got a missionary coming to visit us um, and share some of the work. And then the week after that is our church anniversary. Ian Coffey's going to come and share with us. Uh, and I thought I'd do a series um, because apparently I've been here around 10 years. Um, so May 2014, don't want that five prime ministers ago, um, before, <laughs> before we'd ever heard of a Brexit, um, when Corona was still a beer and not a, a virus that causes pandemics. Uh, a different world uh, where two young people, fresh-faced, without the greys that are coming on the side, um, turned up here and were welcomed and loved into this church. And, and it made me sort of just a bit reflective, thinking about that time and all that God has done, those who are no longer with us, uh, those who are instrumental in us coming and being here, new faces that God has brought to us, uh, new faces that have been added to families, our own included, two young boys uh, that have come along, and the journey that we've been on and, and how God has worked and ministered. It just made me sort of stand back uh, and think about um, what God might do next, what he has done so far. And so I thought I, what I'd do is talk about a part of my ministry that I don't share very often because I see it is my responsibility, um, but it's something that I feel God has given me uh, in particular to do, and that's to pray for you, uh, to pray for God's people, to one, preach and try and give some advice when it's needed and care and, and, and oversee things and look after things. But, but those prayers that I pray when, when no one else is listening but I'm not stood up front and doing it. And I've got to admit that that doesn't come naturally to me. It's something I have to wrestle with and fight with, but I do see it as part of my calling to be praying for you. And I don't just mean the sort of the, the everyday things, Chris with a new hip and, and, and someone else with a gammy toe and, and struggles and all these things that go on in the everyday life. That's all part of it, and I'll, I'll absolutely pray for that. But also to try and pray with a different perspective. To try and stand back and say, God, what is it that you're trying to do with your people? What is it you want to show them? Where is it you want to lead them? Where is it you want to take us? And, and often I come up blank. God, what am I meant to be praying? What am I meant to be asking for? Because I'm here and you've given me this place. And, and, and I'm trying to lead these people, but I'm not really sure even where we're going. So what do I pray? And so often I, I find myself praying and I get a bit stuck. And what I do is I resort to the prayers in Scripture. The, what I call the pastoral prayers. So there are letters written by a person called Paul and others uh, who's planted churches, who's started churches, who's seen them grow. And he writes these letters. And within these letters, you see his prayers, the things that are on his heart, the things that, that burden him, the things that concern him, the things that he is praying for God's people, that they may grow. Now, because it, it's in scripture, I kind of go, well, if it's in there, that's a pretty safe bet. I'll resort to them. And that's not, not to say that, that, that this is the lesser of, of, of options. I think this is the greater. When I go, I don't know what to say, let me return to Scripture and see what is Paul praying? What are the, the pastors in Scripture praying for their church? And can I learn anything from that? So we're going to take five different prayers over the next few weeks and, and just let them teach us how I can pray, but also how we can pray for God's church, how we can lift each other up. What is it we want to invite God to do among us? What is it we're asking God to do in our midst? How can, we, how can he shape us? How can he guide us? This overview, this big picture, which I find these prayers are more often about. Yeah, there are a few about situations and specifics, but a lot of them are, here is what God's heart is for us. Here is what God desires more than anything else. And so we're going to explore them together. Now, I don't know about you, prayer, um, different people have different feelings about it. Some, it comes very naturally. Others find it difficult. Uh, sometimes we can get bored with prayer. Anyone ever fallen asleep praying? Yes. I'll put my hand up. There you go. All the honest people in the room, thank you very much. May Jesus set us all free uh, from that. It, it, we, it, it kind of, we go into a routine, we can get distracted. We start praying. I always remember back when Charles was being put on the throne, praying for the coronation, and then thought, coronation chicken, and oh, I'm hungry, and, and the, the, I could, it was really hard, he kept going down that route, just getting distracted, and, 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 thing. and then we feel guilty, and, we, and we're not doing it right, and, and we try different things, different um, ideas, I don't know if you've ever been in a prayer meeting where you've got to hold hands and pray, and you always seem to end up with one guy, like a dead fish hand, you know, these people, and you're like, come on, give me something, and the other side is like, iron grip, like, the harder they squeeze, the more God's going to answer, um, we try different things in prayer. Sometimes you hear prayers and you're like, that is a good prayer. 
If I was God, I would answer that prayer. These people who, who sound like, like Moses' brother, where they're sort of Jehovah Jireh, they give God special names, and I thank you, you said in Deuteronomy 28, that you'll bless us coming in and going out, and we're the head, not the tail, and they're calling down angels, and they're binding demons, and you think, whoa, that's incredible. And I get this competitive spirit in me where I'm like, right, I'm going to beat them. So I'm like, right, Jehovah, Nissan, Micro, I hope that you come down and your word is like the crumbiest, flakiest chocolate. And um, you're just trying to, trying to work up, trying to get these good prayers going. I think there are two big mistakes that I feel I make in prayers. And perhaps, perhaps we all share in it. I often find that what happens if I, if I just pray for my own steam and my own thoughts, my prayers, one, either become too small Kind of, I, I, they're responsive prayer, they're reactive prayers, which are fine. That's, that's what prayer's for. We can just react and go, I bring this to God. This has happened and I give it to God. But, that, but often it is, it's limited to the size of the problem that's in front of you. God, here's what's happened, and here's what you want to do. And, the, and we never stand back and see a bigger picture of what God might be up to. So we get confined to this one thing. And so our prayers become smaller and smaller. And often also our prayers become quite general, or mine do. God, would you bless them? God, would you help them? God, would you comfort them? All fine prayers, but, but they're, kind of, they're, they're very, very broad in their scope. And what we're going to find is, is Paul prays for broad things, but he does so in a very specific way. There's a pattern of what I do. I'll just show you one prayer um, that, that amazed me as I was doing my research this week. Um, a man called Martin Luther, many of you will know, part of the Reformation, the church, finding a new way back to God, discovering scripture again, discovering the cross and forgiveness and grace and all these things. Um, he was involved in reforming the church. And in 1540, he heard that his friend Myconius was sick. And Myconius had written Luther a letter saying, I expect to die shortly, basically farewell, the end is near, I love you. And he wrote this letter. And Paul, um, Luther sorry, wrote back, and, it, and here's what he wrote in his response. Myconius, I command you in the name of God to live, (laughs) because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. That's a prayer, isn't it? That's a a specific prayer. That's That's a power. That's a big prayer that he prays. Amazingly, Myconius, who had already lost his ability to speak, recovered and went on to live six more years finally dying two months after Luther. God answered this prayer, and it makes me just go, one, really? But also, is there something about prayer that I've missed? What we're going to find in Paul, so we're going to be in some of the letters, the Pauline epistles, if you want to be fancy, if your friends ask you, what do you do at church? You can say, the Pauline epistles. They sound very clever, and they'll say, what's that? I don't know, but the pastor said it. Uh, But that's where we're going to be, these letters that Paul wrote to his church. Paul, who was Saul, for those who may not know, um, he persecuted Christians, he killed Christians, he hated Christians, and then he met Jesus. And his heart was transformed by the grace of Jesus, and he went out, and his whole role was to start up these communities of faith, who believed and followed Jesus, build them up, and then he'd go off and he'd write letters to them to encourage them, to guide them, to lead them, and that's what we have in Scripture. And all the the prayers that we're going to follow, I I found that they follow a certain pattern. They start with this, I pray. And Paul will say then what he's praying for. But then they'll have this next bit that says, so that. I pray this, so that this will happen. And we're going to look at this pattern over and over again. This is why I'm praying, and this is why I'm praying it. And together, they form this this wonderful pattern that that Paul uses again and again to say prayer is not just throwing stuff out there. It has a purpose. It has a role. It's trying to achieve something. It's trying to get something to happen. It's trying to work with God and alongside him to bring his kingdom and, and his work in our lives. And so over and over again, he does it. And today, we're going to be in Ephesians 3, which Trevor read to us written around 60 AD. It's written from a Roman prison. And although it's written to Ephesus, this is probably a letter that was circulated. We think it was probably sent around all the churches in a certain area, different churches to read again and again and again to equip them and mature them. So with that all in mind, let's start in Ephesians, where Paul writes, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth and on earth derives its name. Now you can pray anyway. You can pray standing, you can pray sitting, you can pray lying down, you can pray driving. If you do that, you've got to do what Jesus said, which is watch and pray. Um, don't close your eyes when you're, when you're driving. But you can pray in all different circumstances and situations. In Paul's time, the most common form of prayer was to stand up and to put your hands out. 
kind of, I, I love this, just this picture of this, I'm empty handed, but God, I'm coming. Because prayer is not just about giving you things that you need to do. Prayer is about receiving from God. Prayer is about getting something. It's about saying, oh, I, I need something from you. But Paul says here, this is something that I kneel down about. And a kneeling, it's just that idea that there are some things that we want to get serious about. It's the intent of my heart. We don't do it just because it's, it's what, what we've been asked to do. It's, it's about our heart and our need and our desire. And it's about saying, I give you reverence. I give you honor. There is something that is burdening me. So I kneel down before you. I come before you in this way because this is on my heart. This is something that weighs on me and that I long for. And so he kneels before the Father from whom everyone gets their name. We're all under one God, whoever we are. And he says this, I pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches, and that's how you've got to say it, okay? We're going to, again, this is going to be something each week, this similar phrase comes up, his glorious riches. Because Paul starts his prayer saying, let's get this straight. There is no lack in God. Okay, we, we may feel impoverished, we may feel like we're not getting what we want or what we're asking for, but God, the, the, the glorious riches, there is an abundance with him. Earlier in Ephesians, he said that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Glory, we serve a spiritually rich father. He will, we're told in Philippians that he will meet all our needs through his glorious riches. He is rich, and if we feel impoverished, it may be that we've misunderstood who we are and what we have and how prayer allows us to tap into that. He is glorious, so it's out of his glory. It's not, not God, if you could possibly spare a few minutes, if, if you've got the time, if you've got the energy, if, if, you've got, if you've got enough resources, would you mind just sharing a bit? Paul says, no, he has enough, more than enough, glorious riches. And he prays that out of those glorious, I'll stop doing it now, glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit, through his Spirit in your inner being. This is my prayer, that out of his riches he would strengthen you with power, with dunamis. There we get our word dynamite, this explosive, God, miraculous power. Not like human power, it's the power of God. I want you to have power or strength. I want you to have that so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. In your inner being, he may strengthen your inner being, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The idea of praying for power is we don't have what we need. I need more than I have. Not I want more than I have. That's, that's an, an issue with me where I think I'm lacking, but I don't. But I, I need something. Sometimes I need the ability to be content with what I have. But there is something I need that I currently lack. It's the awareness there is more power available. There is something that, that I, I currently do not have within me. And so I'm praying, God, I need something more. I need power. Maybe it's power to forgive. Maybe it's power to be at peace. Maybe it's power to be confident, power to have faith, to know what to say. But, but I need something in my inner being. I'm lacking something. And, I, and God, you seem to have the power to do it. You seem to be able to equip me or give me what I need. I was with my brother, he moved into a, a little bungalow that they were converting, and they'd been doing it for years and years and years, and went round one time, and he was showing me around, and, and they had a new kitchen installed, and he just said, one thing that's really frustrating me, though, is this switch. I don't know what it does. And they'd flick this switch, and nothing happened, and they'd turn it down, and nothing would happen. They'd flick this switch, and nothing would happen, and until they, they built downstairs a gym to work out in, and suddenly all the equipment stopped working. And they worked out that this switch in another room was powering all the stuff in a separate part of the building. And it's like that, that idea that there, there is a power that, that, that we need. But sometimes we, we don't know the switch. We're going, well, is this doing anything? Yes, it's providing power in a place that you need it. That one little switch, that one thing, God, would you give me power? Would you provide what I need because I don't have it within myself? And the reason I need power in my inner being, he says, is so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through strength. Through faith, sorry. Which is it's such a funny thing to pray, because I, I would pray, well, I need power for this, and, and I know I need strength here, and I need some confidence here. But Paul's very specific. The power you need is so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Just hold that in mind. We'll go on and see if, if as we go on, it teases out and explains what that means. Because Paul almost repeats himself. 
And he says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, so something about Christ in me, it roots me and establishes me in love. He makes his home in me, that I am loved, that I am his, that I belong to him, that we are one. That's what love is. It's he's for me, he's with me, and we are one. That's why marriage is a picture of love, because marriage is we are with each other, we are for each other, hopefully, and we are one. That's the definition of love, that we are with, for, and one. Now, we have that if Christ is in us. But then he says, may you have power again, together with all the Lord's people. So we need more power. Okay, so you've got a power so that Christ can dwell in you. Now you need more power so that you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Why do we need power? Paul says you need power so that Christ can dwell in you. But you need power so that you can know how much God loves you. Like I said, it's a prayer perhaps familiar with, but it's an odd way of putting it. You need power to know how much God loves you. Because we would say, no, 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 I need, I need weakness, don't I? I, I, I need to, to realize I, I need forgiving. I need to realize that, that I am nothing, but that God has died for me. That's what I need to know that Christ loves me. But Paul puts it differently. You need power to understand his love. To try and illustrate this, I've brought in um, some weights that I own. Um, and rarely use, but I, I own. Um, <laughs> back when we were in lockdown, they got a bit more use. Um, but they do that. They sit in our sitting room, and the boys love them because these are special weights because um, they didn't want loads of weights all over the place. So they take up a lot of space. So what these weights are is they've got little numbers on them, which you might not be. 2.5. There you go. Yeah, so you cheat. So that's 2.5 kilograms. I don't know what that is in old money. Five pounds, something like that. So that's five pounds. But what you can do is you put them in, and then you can adjust them. So if you turn that one and that one up to 5.5, then what it does, look, is it adds weights on, so now that's 5.5. Okay, so it gets a bit heavier. And then if you queue it up again, this is what the boys like to do. They start off on the lowest one, and they turn it up and try and pick it up, and then they'll go up again. There you go, so that's 10. Getting, ooh, getting there a bit now, okay. Um, and they try and pick it up, and then they go up again, and they, they try and pick it up. Oops, not going back together now. Just messed it up. It goes there. There you go. And you can keep going up, and they keep trying to lift it, and they try and lift it, and eventually you get up to 24 kilograms. What's that? 50 pounds. So, <laughs> there you go. So you can get up to the highest, and the boys normally can't get there. They try each time to try and lift it up, and they get a bit heavier, and they get a bit heavier, and eventually they reach a point, and each week they're trying to get a bit more, one more click along and see how far they can get. And Paul, what Paul says is that's what it's like with God's love. God's love surpasses knowledge, okay? It is too big. It, it is not 50 pounds. It is it's a million pounds. It's, it's, no one could hold it. But I'm praying that you would have power to grasp it. Because the problem of most people is not that they don't believe that God loves them. It's not that they don't know that God loves them. They've heard it. But there is something in us. We are too weak to take hold of the fact that God loves us. There is a weakness in us that means we cannot hold on to the fact that God would love me. Some people, their, their weakness comes because they've been hurt. Or they've, been, they've never been shown love. Or they've been betrayed. And, and, and it's caused in them this weakness that means when they hear God loves you, they, they aren't able to hold it. They, they don't have the strength. So they just put it down and go, no, 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 not for me. <gasps> yeah, I could try. No, 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 I can't pick it up, so it's not for me. And this vast love of God remains where it is. It's fine. And you can get on. You're rooted and established in love. That's what Paul says. But you cannot fully grasp the vastness of it. And that happens to all of us. Every hurt, every slight, every comment, everything that happened that didn't communicate you, that communicated to us that you aren't loved, it shrinks our capacity to believe, to accept God would love me. And so Paul says, I pray you would have the strength again. That you would heal, the muscles would heal, the heart would heal, the strength would heal. You'd work out that exercise so that you could take hold of this fact that God loves you. Because there's a weakness in us that means you can't. Others can't receive it because our weakness is that we feel like we have to be worthy of love. That it's about our worth. And Christians can be guilty of this as much as anyone else. We add small print to the contract. Jesus gave it all for me, so I have to give my all for him. If I don't give my all for him, then he doesn't love me. But that isn't what Jesus says. He doesn't say, I've loved you so much, you have to love me. He loves us, and that love woos out of us, draws out of us our own love. We don't have to. 
But we just, we just realize we are loved first, and so we love in return. But there's a weakness. The weakness is if I'm not worthy, then I can't be lovable. And Paul says, get rid of that. You need strength. You need a power to take hold of the love of God. Or maybe you were the most loved child in the world with the most loving spouse when you grew up, and your capacity to receive love is fairly big. Paul says, fine, but we're talking about a love that surpasses knowledge. Even you are not strong enough to take hold of what God has for you. So even you, if you, were, you have no wounds or no problems that you feel like you, don't, you can't see it, he says you're still not strong enough. You can still pick up more. There is still more to receive. This love that surpasses knowledge is for you. You either weren't loved, so you can't believe there is a love like this, or you were loved, so you don't believe you need a love like this. But either one, Paul says, let me pray that you would have power, that you would have a strength, a capacity, if you like, to receive this love for you. Notice he doesn't just say, I pray that you'd know God's love. That's how I would pray. I pray that you'd all know God's love. Paul's a bit more specific, a bit more direct. I pray that you would have power, because that's your problem. Not that you you don't get it, you haven't heard it, that hasn't been preached, you haven't studied it. That isn't the problem. The problem is you lack the power to receive it for yourself. And I believe that this this is what Paul's saying, that we need this supernatural work to reveal to us, to show to us, to empower us to receive this love. Because most of us live in a world, we all live in a world, that shrinks our capacity, that makes us weaker and weaker over time. But to know that it's not a, not a won't often, it's often a can't. Some of you will have family members, those that you pray for. And you, it may on the surface appear that they won't believe, they don't want to believe, they're not interested. Paul could say to us, well, it could possibly be that they just lack the capacity. That you've come and you've shown them, they've seen God's love, but they go, no, not for me, sorry. That they lack the, the strength to hold it. Something has happened, something has gone on, something in their their wiring, this sin nature that twists and and screws everything up. It means that when it comes, the love is there. God can do no more to show us his love. You don't need to pray, God, show them your love because he's already shown it. It's us who lack the power to receive it. And so instead, what they do is they search for elsewhere in people or relationships or, or some sort of purpose. And what they're doing makes perfect sense because we all have this desire. We want to feel loved But the best that this world has to offer is the natural love of another person, which is good. It's a nice thing. It's a wonderful thing. But it's still not a love that surpasses knowledge, a love that you cannot get your head around. The idea of you complete me is a lie because the hole in us is too big for any other person to fill. You'll either have gaps around the edges or you'll crush the person that you try and fill it with because they cannot live up to it. But God's love is vast, surpasses knowledge. And it's not just what he does, it's who he is. The eternal God beginning and end outside of space and time is love. And the hole in us is made for that God to fill. There is one who fills it, which is why Paul goes on and says, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When you're praying God's love to fill someone, what you're praying is for God to fill someone because God is love. It's not like God's here and I'm going to give you some love. God's here and he says, I'm going to give you myself. But you, you're going to need some big hands to hold it. You're going to need some more capacity, some more power because it's going to blow your mind. It's going to expand your borders. You, you aren't going to believe that this is possible. You're going to go, no, 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 that's too much. <laughs> no, I could, no, stop, stop. And he's going to say, well, just to get some more power. I'm not going to stop loving this. Let's increase your power that you can receive this. This steadfast love that endures forever. This love that's the same yesterday, today, and forever because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And sometimes you'll meet people and go, what is it they have that I don't? Do they have something? Because they have a peace and, and they stay calm and, and they, they, there's, there's a grace about them. You go, have they got something that I haven't? The answer is yes. They flipped a switch. They found this power that enables them to receive something that they could not receive by themselves. Something that they cannot achieve by themselves. They're not better people than you. They've just found a God of glorious riches. Who says, I'll give you the power to receive what I want to give. 
And so I think one of the best prayers you can pray for your children is that they would know, have the power to know how much God loves them. That they'd have the capacity. Because believe it or not, they're going to live in a world where the opinions of others matters an awful lot. And the pressure of others is going to shape them. And for them to know they are loved beyond that. That their identity, who they are, all that matters about them is rooted and grounded in the love of God. No matter what others might say or do or how well they do and all the other measures that we seem to put on children to be filled with the fullness of that. For me, that feels like a good prayer to pray. One of the best prayers you can pray for your your spouse, for your family members, that they would have the power to know how much God loves them. How much more would would they be easier people to live with if they knew they were loved? How much easier would we be to live with if we knew how much we were loved? When it's not a competition, when I'm not trying to get more or, or get my due, where I'm loved and that's enough, where I'm held and that's enough. And for me, I think one of the best prayers I can pray for our church is that you would have the power to know how much God loves you. For some have been, have lacked that capacity, either from, from your upbringing or your experience. Some it's the hurt of another church. Some it's, it's just situations that you've been through, but over time, this world will diminish our capacity to hold it. But Paul says, I pray that you would have power, along with all God's people, everyone together, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What do you mean, Paul? Know something that surpasses, that, that's, an, that's a paradox. I know something that's unknowable. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. I want you to know something that you can't possibly fully know. I want you to grasp something that you couldn't possibly fully grasp. I want you to have something that you couldn't possibly have in its entirety. That's how vast this is. But still we press in. Still we receive. How do they get this power? It's, Paul says, I, I need to pray for it. Famous jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong was once asked to explain jazz. And he said, man, if you've got to explain it to you, you ain't got it. Now I know with jazz, I ain't got it. Because they have a jazz night over at the checkers every now and then. And all I hear is, brown, 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 brown. And then that ends that song. And it starts with the next one. It goes, brown, 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 brown. And every song sounds, I ain't got it. I ain't got it with jazz. But I'm trying to get it with God's love. And I, and I, and I, and I, I stumble and I fumble when I, I try and preach. <laughs> I'd always notice it because I'm trying to explain the inexplainable. I'm trying to help you know something that you, <laughs> I can't possibly know myself. It surpasses knowledge. But it's something that we can receive. Charles Finney, a famous evangelist in the 1800s, once wrote this. He'd become a follower of Jesus, and then he had this deeper encounter with God. And he described it in this way. He said, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love, for I could not express it in any other way. It seemed like the very breath of God. And even he is stumbling and fumbling to try and explain. It's, it's these waves that roll over. Just when you think you're done with one, another comes. Just when you think you've exhausted it, there's another wave. Just when you think, oh, I finally got it. No, there's another one coming around the corner. And it comes and it comes and it comes and it overwhelms and it washes liquid love that fills me up. As it fills me up, it, it flows from me. Not because of what I do, but because it's who he is. This love that heals, this love that restores, this love that sets me right, this love that diminishes the voice and the opinion of others, this voice that frees me, this love that that holds me, this love that roots me, it keeps me grounded, this love that establishes me, it's the the boundaries of of who I am, It's it's my identity, this love that has rescued me, and this love that Paul says it's yours. You just need the power to get it. Just the power to hold it. And so I pray. I pray that that you have power. Supernatural power to understand how much God loves you. And that it would be like waves rolling over. Just when you think you understand it, more would come. And so that I can pray this for the church. Because it covers everyone. For someone just starting out who's just got a thimble full at the moment. Power for them that they would have more love. For the person who's been doing this and they're 100 years old and they've got it all, all seemingly made, they still haven't exhausted it. I can pray this for every person at every stage, whatever the situation. May they have power to understand your love. 
because it, while it might not sort out the specifics and the details and the minutiae of what you might be going through, it holds you. It draws you back and says, maybe this isn't going to get sorted in the way I think. Or maybe this situation isn't going to work out how I thought it should. But if I stand back and I let myself be absorbed, surrounded, filled to the fullness of God by his love, that it doesn't maybe change the situation, although often it does, but it changes me, my inner being, Paul says. And that's my prayer. Yep, the external, but all that is fading away. All of that is wasting away. The hair's getting grayer, the ears get bigger, the nose hairs get more extreme. It, that, that, outwardly, we're wasting away, but inwardly, to be renewed day by day. And I feel as a pastor, that's my prayer. Yes, I, I, all the external stuff, it, it breaks my heart that I pray for it and it brings tears to my eyes when the suffering and things, but to be able to stand back and go, but they there still be love. Even, even if, if not, even if you're calling them home, may, may they do so knowing they are loved, knowing they are held, knowing this love that surpasses knowledge. For those who, who are dragging themselves in, who lack purpose, to know they have a spiritually rich father, to know that there are glorious riches and that we can't fully comprehend, which is why I love how Paul ends. You kind of go, right, I want you to know Jesus in you. That's, that's wonderful. Wow, what a huge idea. And then I want to pray that you'd have power to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Oh, man, it's too much. And then he goes on and says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more. Oh, I give up. There's more. What are you talking about? More? The vastness of God's love, he says, now he can do even more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power, that is at work where? Within us. The power that is in us that he can do this work. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And you try and just go, oh, mercy, Paul, I give up. It's too much. And maybe that's the point. To get to the point where you go, I, I can't fully, this, let it, uh, no, this is too much. And there's more. And Paul goes, exactly. You have barely begun to tap the, the, the perimeter of who God is. You've barely begun to scratch the surface of his immeasurably more, the richnesses of his glory that is for us who believe. And so he gets the glory. When he does this, when he reveals this, when if the penny drops, even if it's just for a moment, then we go, give him the glory. Because there's no way I could grasp this by myself. There was no way I'd even come up with this kind of love. A God of love is fine, but not this much love. Come on, that's a bit excessive. It's a bit over the top, isn't it? I wouldn't come up with that kind of love. Not the kind of love that would come and live among us. Not a kind of love that would let us spit in his face and slap him and still return in prayers of forgiveness. Not the kind of love that would allow himself to be crucified, humiliated, the king of heaven, and still respond in kindness and mercy. Not that kind of love. Not the kind of love that doesn't have anything to his name and has to be laid in a borrowed tomb. Not that kind of love. And not a love that would rise from the grave and not return with vengeance, but return with more grace and more forgiveness. No, that, not that kind of love. You're going too far. And Paul says exactly. But this is the love that is ours in Christ. The love that he put on display that we would forever be without any question. Does he love me? We look to the cross. We look to the empty grave. We look to the Savior who today still invites us and we would know, of course he does. The question has never been whether he loves us. It's our weakness, our inability to grasp it. And so Paul makes that his prayer, that he who would do immeasurably more according to his power in us, that we need to pray that God would do a work in us, that we could grasp this thing. The greatest thing that you can picture, he can do more. The greatest love that you could describe, it is more. You are not on your own. His power is in you. It's what he does. And so we pray this. I pray this. And I invite you to pray this. Lord, would you give this church power to comprehend your love? As we seek your power, would you release your spiritual blessings? You are ready to give. But we want to be ready to receive. To see that power in our daily lives. See the power in that kind of prayer. The faith that's in that kind of prayer. Not just God help me in this week or in this situation, but Lord, may generations be different. Not just keep my child out of trouble, that's, that's a fine prayer, but God, your love is able to change their heart, to raise them up. 
Would they be spiritual leaders in the places that they are? Would they be empowered to stand firm, rooted in your love? That kind of prayer. Not just, God, help me get through this day, but, Lord, in my place, may I radiate your love. I feel weak. I feel powerless to do it, but would you fill me up that I would shine brightly, that I would be a beacon in that place for you, that something about what what you've given me would pour out into those around me. God, not just would you make me well, that's a, that's a fine prayer to prayer, but Paul says, no, that you'd be filled up that, that in your appointments, in your, in your conversations, in your testimony, that you'd be saying, God has held me, God has kept me, that I am loved despite this. Away, This world around me doesn't define me. The, the, the situation I'm in doesn't define his love. The cross does. What I'm going through doesn't define his love. The cross does. What I've experienced, what I've suffered, what I've lacked doesn't define his love. The cross does. And so I I have no doubt, whatever I'm going through, I can still pray, God, give me power to receive your love even in this place. The faith to believe big things or bigger things. That's it. It's everyone. If If you think I've got it, you haven't. But good, I'm I'm glad you feel like you have, but don't don't miss out, there is more. And at the end, he says, we give God the glory. It's only because he showed up. It's only because he opened my heart. It's only because he opened my eyes. It's only because he he worked in me. And may he get the glory for generations and generations to come. So perhaps I should pray. Pray for us. Pray as Paul prays. Pray as as the Holy Spirit inspired him to pray. Father, I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would minister to the people of God today here. I pray that out of your glorious riches, that you would strengthen this church with your power, that Christ may dwell within our hearts. I pray, God, that we would have power to know how much you love each one, but not just each one, all of us together, your family, your people that we would glorify you in all we do. Father, I pray today for those weakened in their ability to receive that love, that today you would give them power to grasp more of what is ungraspable. I pray that they would not be put off by any lack of understanding or feeling overwhelmed. It's your love that heals and restores and frees and comforts. Would you give them the strength to receive it for themselves? Lord, I pray for those who have some measure of that power. I pray for more more than they could ask or imagine, more than they thought was possible, wave upon wave of love. And Father, I pray that over these next few days, that as together, as one people, we pray these prayers, that we would seek your power, that you would release the spiritual blessings that you have stored up for us, ready to give us in heavenly places, and we'd begin to see the reality of your power in our daily lives. God, I pray for those that we love, that they would have the power to know how much you love them. We can all bring to mind those who have said no, those who've turned away, those who thought it's not for them. And I pray, God, that we would see a difference in their lives as you strengthen them to receive that love. Because you are revealing your supernatural love for each one of us. May you open their eyes to see it. Would you give them strength to grasp it? And God, for those who who even today feel that stirring, that desire to believe you for the impossible, I pray, God, that you would continue to build their faith, that all things are possible with you. And when those little voices say, well, God doesn't care or God won't do this, that we will continue to believe in faith. And God, if you, if you answer our prayers, we will praise you. And if you don't do what we think we, you should, then we will praise you because we don't come to you for what you can do for us. We come to you because we need you. We sung it today. We want you to know you. We want to to, to be in your love. And we are. And so we come to you before who else could we go to? Build the faith of this community that we would experience the true power of the resurrected Christ dwelling within us and the love that he has for us. And even with all that, Father, with all that we've asked, all that we long for, We pray that to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we've just asked or imagined, according to his power that is at work within us, to you, Father, be glory in this church, in our church, 
and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.